Hey, hello. Uh, my name is Hannes, and today I want to talk to you guys about your careers. And my clicker seems to be not working. Great. They'll cut this out in editing before they publish the video, I'm sure. Uh, so here we go again. Yeah, now I'm there. Okay. Hello, my name is Hannes, um, and today I want to talk to you um, about your careers. Um, it's 6 a.m. here, as I just told you, um, and it still feels, feels weird to do this whole thing remotely because one of the things that I really enjoy about conferences is connecting to people, meeting new people, and seeing the faces that I'm speaking to. And this is, this is so strange. I'm staring at three screens and standing in my garage. But it's still a lot better than not having any conferences at all because I'm really passionate about knowledge sharing and learning from each other. Um, so I prefer doing this over having no NDC Sydney at all. So I'm happy to be here. Um, it's our careers are mostly unaffected as software developers. So this pandemic hasn't hurt us too badly. Most of us still have a steady stream of income. We can do our work from home. And it's those careers that I'm here to talk to you about today. Um, and also, I'm going to talk to you about Mario Kart. Um, I started living my childhood memories with my two sons when Sinterklaas, who is the Belgian version of Santa Claus, uh, brought a Switch for my kids about three years ago. But even after three years, we still play Mario Kart from time to time. We heckle each other. We sit on the couch. Um, and it's just good old family time. And when I was thinking about this talk, um, and a lot of it is very serious stuff and, and not really fun to put into a talk, I was thinking I needed some kind of twist to, um, to give this story. And when I was playing Mario Kart, it hit me. I could find anal analogies for pretty much anything in Mario Kart. So that's where we are today. So let's dive in. And when we talk about careers, the first thing that we're going to talk about is success. And this is why I didn't. Uh, really dive into who I am yet, because I'm going to use myself as an example um, to sketch you how we have to deal with success. Now, I could present myself to you like this. My name is Hannes. I am the head of learning and development at a company called Access. Um, I coach 53 other .NET developers at my company. Um, my wife is called Barbara, and we've been together for about 15 years. Um, I have, I'm the, the father, the proud father of three kids, um, Arne, Joren, and Marit, um, who I dearly love. I combined the uh, two degrees when I graduated from, uh, from college in the same year, um, and I am, am an international speaker at a lot of conferences all over the world, and I'm an amateur guitar builder. Now, if I would sketch this image to you, that looks like a very successful person. Um, and I wouldn't disagree with you. I think I've had some nice successes over the years. But um, I did get to a point in my life where I would say that most of the things are in order. But I didn't always feel like this. If I would sketch myself to you like this, that's a whole different story. I was a weird kid growing up, and I was bullied in uh, elementary and in high school. Um, I'm not the best programmer I know, not even by a mile. When I started college, I failed two years in a row. I failed my exams. I had to uh, do the year again, and I actually eventually ended up switching majors. I'm a little bit overweight. Um, I still have to lose about 10 kilos, I guess, to be in within the acceptable BMI range. I had a severe burnout and depression in 2012. I need glasses to properly see. And sometimes I lose my temper when my kids annoy me or when something gets on my nerve. Now, that's a far less flattering image. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Success is a matter of perspective. It's the way that you look at things. And these two persons that I just explained you about, they cannot exist without each other because they are both me. And they're both an essential part of who I am. And I can assure you that for every successful person you know, there is a flip side that is far less successful. 
But we live in, a, in an age of social media and social media are really, really toxic in this regard. Because what we all do is we post all of our successes on social media and we hide our failures. And when you compare yourself to what you see on social media, it's basically the same thing as um, comparing your own unedited footage to um, somebody else's highlight reel. Because in your own life, you see everything. You see the highs, you see the lows, and you also see the business as usual days. And from everybody else's life, you're only going to see the highlights. Maybe some of the lows, but not the business as usual, boring, weekday, rush to get the kids to school kind of thing. And those are totally different angles to look at some person's life. Now, I promised you that we would be getting into Mario Kart, let's, so let's go there. If you're a little bit like me and you want to see what success looks like in Mario Kart, what you're probably going to do is you're going to Google um, Mario Kart World Champion or something like that. And you'll end up on a website called MK Leaderboards. MK Leaderboards is a uh, website that keeps ranking from all the fastest time trial laps in Mario Kart. And you will find a Spanish guy called Alberto. Now, Alberto is topping the leaderboards, there is no doubt, nobody is even close, but you can see there's a very respectable third place for uh, one of your Aussie friends, um, a guy called Panda, and a fourth place for one of our Belgians called Thomas, so that was nice to see. I didn't plan this in any way, uh, but it was cool to, to see this. Um, but to get back to Alberto, you, you start wondering how good is this guy really, right? So you Google a little bit further and you'll find a video of one of the laps that, that he has recently done, one of the record laps that he is driving. And I don't know how much you know about, about Mario Kart, but it, it's not important. Um, what you'll see here is if you understand a little bit what's going on, this, this guy's lines are incredible. You know, he is making zero mistakes. He is um, cutting corners where he can, and he is driving on the edge the whole time. And driving like this would be completely impossible for mere mortals like us. So if we're going to compare our skills to Alberto, um, that's going to be a little bit comparing apples to oranges. Or like we will uh, like to put it in Mario Kart terms, it's like comparing baby Mario in a submarine to Link on a motorcycle. Because if you play casually with your, with your kids like I do, it doesn't really matter which vehicle you take or which character because you're probably going to beat them on skill anyway. But if you're in the time trial business like Alberto is, which character you choose, which cart, which tires, which wing, it all really affects your performance because all of these things really minorly affect the driving characteristics of your uh, Mario Kart game. And there are some, some major differences um, between them. But let's get back to Alberto, right? This is you. And you're looking at the mountain. And the mountain represents all the skills that you would hope to acquire. It represents everything that you want to achieve in Mario Kart or otherwise. But let's assume Mario Kart. And Alberto, he's already on top of that mountain. He has already achieved all of that. And he is looking forward to his next challenge, maybe another mountain behind the horizon. And let's say that today you took a month off and you, you took a month playing Mario Kart really intensively. And you would play nonstop. Now, the chances are that this image didn't really change. You would still feel like you're very far from the top of that mountain. In fact, it would probably be worse because during that month, you will have gained appreciation what it is to be really, really good at Mario Kart. And you will actually understand how good Alberto really is. And you will actually feel that you're even further from him because you now understand the real distance between you two. You're actually in that valley between yourself and the mountain at that point. So if we're going to compare careers that Alberto is not really the guy that we should be looking at. It, this is a typical problem when you compare yourself to others. If you look at someone, then you forget that you're both in a different place. And it's really apples and oranges because you forget to consider that there are really, really important differences. Did you start out 
having equal talent? And the answer is no, probably not. Did you have equal experiences in life that prepared you for this moment? No, probably not. Did you spend an equal amount of time on this thing that you're trying to be good at? And with Alberto, I can assure you, no, none of us have ever, uh, probably all of us combined haven't spent enough time playing Mario Kart to, to get close to his time. Did you go in with the same amount of focus? When I play Mario Kart with, I, with my kids, I'm not focused at all. We're just having fun. I'm not focusing on, on, on lap times. I'm just trying to beat my nine-year-old. And did you have equal opportunities in life? Did you get the same uh, chances to actually get to the point where you are? Because that's really important to think about when you're in IT. Because when you're in IT, chances are that the programming heroes that you look at, um, and then I'm not talking about the Elon Musks or the Bill Gateses or whatever. No, I'm talking like the programming heroes closer to home that might work at the same company. You're, you might be competing with somebody in their 30s who still lives at, at their parents' place and where the mom takes care of the laundry and the household and making the food, and he doesn't have to care about anything but programming. Might be a guy who doesn't have any hobbies or doesn't have a partner or doesn't have any friends. If you're going to compare your skills and this one aspect of the whole story, just your skills, to that guy, you're always going to lose. So you're, you shouldn't be comparing until you take all the factors into account and you make sure that they're all equal. And if they're not equal, you have to consider all the bigger picture. And that makes it a lot easier to, to look at your own success in relation to others, because I do have hobbies and I do have a partner and I do have kids. So it doesn't really matter that there are better programmers out there than I, because they might have sacrificed way more than I did to get there. So instead of comparing, we should have a much better plan to make goals for ourselves. And the first question that you should ask yourself is, in what direction do I want to take my career? And that is more like a long-term view. And I don't, I, I'm not asking you to think about where do I want to be in 20 years. Um, Think in a window of maybe three to five years, because from experience, um, from coaching a lot of people, I know that in that time window, like three to five years, a, a lot of the factors stay steady enough to, to actually plan for it. But a lot of things change that after this period, you're going to need a new plan. Because technology evolves, new opportunities in the market arise, you will learn things about yourself, about what you um, like what you dislike and that sort of stuff. Um, so a long-term plan, three to five years is ex excellent. <clears throat> Focus on that window. And the reason that I set direction and not goal um, is on purpose because there's so many things that are going to happen in that time frame that pinning yourself on a goal for a period that long would be a very bad idea. But it's good to have some sort of direction, what you want out of your career, and start moving forward towards that. But deciding on this general dire direction will help. Uh, it will give you focus when you're working on your career. It will give you a frame of reference when you are setting smaller goals. It will give you a direction uh, when you have to make smaller decisions. And that's what Mario Kart also does for you. When you're going the wrong way, you see this direction arrow that you see in the screen right now. And that is what your direction is going to do for you. It will basically tell you where to go next. And it's good to keep this in the back of my head. Um, when I started doing this, um, probably around 15 years ago for myself, that is when I made, I started making better decisions about my own career. And I try to tell the people that I coach to do the same thing. And it seems to be working very well for them. Most of them find this exercise very helpful. Some of them left the company because of that, because they decided that they needed to go somewhere else to achieve what they want. But that's good on them. I mean, they are achieve, achieving what they want. And that's what all your career should be about. But now that you have your general 
uh, direction, we should look at defining some goals. And I like using myself as an example. I'm going to talk a little bit about playing chess. My current goal is to get my uh, blitz rating on Lee Chess above 1200. Now, I don't know. Uh, my current rating is around 1150. That means that I'm in the 12th percentile. That means that about 88% of the chess players on Lee Chess are better than I am. Now, that may, may not seem as a very ambitious goal at all. And you might be right. 1200 is not that high a rating. And I'm not that good a chess player. But you have to, I mean, to put 1200 into perspective, most teenagers in our chess club have a rating of 1500 or higher, um, which is a huge difference. My rating would probably not be enough to win a tournament with 11 year olds, just to give you a bit of a reference there if you're not into chess yourself. I still believe that my current goal of achieving 1200, uh, 1200 rating would be a good one. And the reason is this. I only started playing chess in 2018 when my oldest son started playing. And the reason that I started playing along with him is that my oldest son, he's very highly gifted and he had the tendency to give up on anything that got hard. And I was pretty sure that chess would get hard. Um, and I was scared that he would dive into another hobby and he would g give up again. So I had the plan to set an example for my son. I would get into chess together with him. I would start practicing. I wanted to keep challenging him. I wanted him to not give up at the same time as having an example, an example in front of uh, his nose on how to do it. That was my direction when it came to, to chess. And so far, I think I've been pretty successful because my son's rating is um, still lower than mine. So I can still consistently, uh, consistently win matches against him. Not all of them, but we're doing good. Um, my rating rose from around 800 to 1150 in two years, which is quite a good improvement. I recently also became a youth trainer at my chess club. So I'd, I'd say that for... From my frame of reference, I'm doing pretty well in chess. If I would compare myself to the Alberto of chess, who is uh, Magnus Carlsen, this would not really be impressive at all. But that isn't my frame of reference. I set my own goals, my own direction where I want to be, and I'm going there every day. I played probably, on average, three chess matches online a day since I started playing. Um, so yeah, it is, it is a consistent time sink for me. But I shouldn't compare myself to Magnus Carlsen. I should compare myself to myself. Mario in a go-kart to Mario in a go-kart. You are your own competition. And you're not racing Alberto. You are racing yesterday's you. You are racing last year's you. You're not racing your colleagues. You're not racing your Twitter heroes or Bill Gates or John Carmack. No. If you keep your goals focused on yourself, then you have something that is a fair frame of reference when you're setting goals. But it's in our nature to compare. And that's why it's hard to, to keep the focus on yourself. And that's why it really helps to write this stuff down from time to time. But I really encourage you to do so because if you want to keep your sanity, um, I really, really, should advise you to keep your goals only on yourself. So how do you do that? How do you define good targets? Targets that will actually help you to move forward. And this is the cliche of um, every self-improvement course. But Mario Kart, again, has the answer. And the answer is SMART. And for those who haven't heard about SMART yet, which is probably like maybe one person in this call, I'm quickly going to reiterate what setting SMART goals is. SMART goals are goals that should be very specific. And a specific goal is not, I want to get better at Mario Kart. A specific goal is, I want to get a certain lap time on a certain track. It should be measurable. I mean, this one, I should be able to measure if I actually beat that, that lap time, which is really easy to do, right? 
it should be achievable. If I set my lap time goal at the goal at the lap time that Alberto dry, drove last week, that's not going to be achievable for me, and that makes it a really bad goal. Unless you're already really close to that time. Well, let's assume that we're not. It should be relevant. I mean, the goal should be relevant to what you're trying to achieve in the bigger scheme of things, which is your direction that we just talked about. It should be a goal that brings you closer to achieving that. And then it should be time-based. I mean, you should set a deadline for yourselves. I, when do I want to achieve this goal? The reason that we make it time-based is not because we really have to hit that time to make our steady progress. It's just that we have a timestamp where we will actually reevaluate um, our goal and maybe adjust it. And that's an important thing to do. And for most people, if you set a target like this, they will know what to do. They will start moving forward um, and things will, will go easy um, from there on. But for some people, this goal will still be daunting. It will still seem blurry and far away and very, very hard, high, uh, very, very hard to hit. Just like my son um, and me, because I've also had to learn how to deal with it, you might be someone who um, isn't used to taking challenges where they aren't sure if they will succeed. And that's okay. But it's something that is really easy to overcome. And if your goal seems too hard to achieve, what you should ask yourself is, what is the smallest step I can take today that gets me closer to reaching my goal? And that is what you should be focusing on and not all the other things. And if you start doing this, what you will be doing is you will every day, you will make a small step towards reaching that goal that you're currently working on. And progress is the most important thing, because as long as you keep moving and you don't stand still, you will get there eventually. You might not get there by the time that you first set, but you will get there. And breaking goals into smaller steps is a really, really helpful process. I've also learned this as, as a coach at Access. If people come to me and it's like, I want to be there, but I don't know how to get there, we just break it down into smaller steps. And I, I will make those smaller steps into like mini mini goals for them like micro goals we're living in a microservice world so why why can we not have micro goals right so you have micro goals for yourself and you you focus on those you complete them and you keep moving and as soon as you complete them you ask yourself the same question over and over and over again what is the smallest step i can take today um and after a while, it will become a habit of doing this. It will come naturally, and you will not even think about it any, uh, anymore. And you will be able to tackle these goals in one go without really wondering about what all the little steps will be. And when you're in IT, at least some of your goals will be about learning. And here again, Mario Kart can help us um, see how we, we best deal with learning stuff. Now, the first thing that you're going to have to worry about is how do you like to learn? Um, just like choosing what do you want to play? And because obviously um, learning used to be for a better part of things, it used to be classroom training, but that is not true anymore. Like two, dec de two decades ago, it mostly was, but now you have so many options and a lot of them are a lot cheaper uh, or even free. Um, compared to classroom training. So if you would look at single player, um, if you have to learn a new um, framework by yourself and you, you, you just start coding and exploring and, and reading the docs and, and figuring it out, that would be like single player learning. Multiplayer is where you go pair programming or mob programming and you learn from the people uh, and you discover together, um, which is great. Um, learning from each other is, is, is something that works very well from, for a lot of people. Or you could go and do online play. We have so many online resources that can help you learn. You have Plural site, you have blog posts, you have Channel 9, all these training video sites that are available to you. There is so much quality content out there. And for some people, that works really, really well. And if we would go wireless, like we're not wired to the internet anymore, we can think about books. Um, there are still a lot of people who prefer reading a book because it disconnects them from all the, the distractions from the screen and they can focus on what's in front of them. 
So don't disregard books uh, just yet. Now, when you find out what does and does not work for you, that, that is a really important thing because I personally don't like classroom training. Um, I get bored um, and I fall asleep and that sort of stuff. So that really, really, really doesn't work for me. What does work is a workshop where we're actually doing stuff and coding together. And it's more like an instructor-led self-paced training. That works really well for me. I also really like mob programming. Um, if you haven't heard about mob programming, um, look up some talks by Woody Zool on it. Uh, he invented it, and it's a really, really great way to work as a team and to learn from each other. And if I have to look stuff up, uh, stuff up um, if I need a reference for, for something, then I usually dive into Plural Sight or I'll um, grab a book. But when we figure out how we want to learn, um, we should also think about how we're going to pace our learning because pacing is very, very important. If you dive into Mario Kart and you drive 50cc, chances are that it will be very easy for you to beat the race and to win. So if your goal is I want to, to beat the 50cc race and that is my learning goal, you will probably not learn that much um, because you'll stay in your comfort zone where Stuff is easy and you win. But on the opposite side, it's just as bad. If you pick a level that is so far beyond your skill, you'll start to drown and you will be tangling in last position for the whole race. And you're also not going to learn anything because all the people are so far ahead of you that you cannot look at what lines are they driving um, and you're not going to learn much either. Um, you're drowning. And in Mario Kart, the solution to this is the bullet bill, bill power-up. If you're dangling in 12th position, um, some of the power-ups are only available to you then. And one of them is the, the bullet bill. And that will transform you into this rocket, which automatically follows the track and catches up to the pack and either, even overtakes a few people. But overtaking people like that doesn't really show any skill. It doesn't put any merit on you and you certainly didn't learn anything doing so you just got a power up and in in real life this can happen as well if you're in a team and you're really so far beyond what your real skill is other people will need to pick up your slack and that's the rest of your team your teammates and they will have to drag you through the race just like the bullet bill will do in mario kart and this is also not a really good situation to be in because you're not able to advance on your own. So what you should do is pick a level that is just outside your comfort zone. You can kind of follow the pack, but you can't win the race. But you can feel that the challenge that is in front of you um, is achievable and that you can achieve success on your own if you really wanted to. It doesn't mean that you cannot get help from teammates anymore, but it should be possible to get there on your own. And those are challenges where you really learn because a lot of the stuff that you're doing, you've got that covered and you only have to focus on the things that you're learning at that moment. And that's when you really can learn optimally because you aren't fully overwhelmed with what's happening um, and you can put your energy where you need it. So when you're making progress, this is the best place to be. Um, when you are just outside of your comfort zone and being triggered by, by the stuff that's happening around you. And when you first finish in second place on your own merits, that's when you feel that victory is, is within reach. And that will motivate you to keep going because the goal is right in front of your nose and you're going to want to put in that little bit of effort, that little extra push to finally succeed. So learning a little bit out of your comfort zone, that's going to be the best way to make steady progress. And in IT, I believe that this comfort zone is um, a good idea to, to step out of from time to time, also skill-wise. Um, I think it's a good idea to occasionally learn something that you don't really need in your day job. Maybe a framework or a programming language that really interests you, but you don't, you're not going to need tomorrow. Not only does it keep your learning sharp, but it also teaches you to look um, at the problems that you're faced with daily from another angle, from another perspective. 
And I'm a huge fan of conferences for this one, um, because if you are at a conference like this uh, NDC Sydney that we're in right now, you are triggered by all the conversations that you're having with your peers. You're, uh, you're, you're listening to talks by speakers about subjects that, that you might not be applying tomorrow, but that are interesting for the future. And this, this you, you will probably take home a lot of triggers that you can work with afterwards. Um, and that is not maybe learning by itself, but it is the trigger to start learning new things, which is very important as well. Now you've got your um, your goals, you know how to learn new stuff. And the next thing that you should look at is the environment that you're in. And of course, it is important that your family and your loved ones support what you're doing in your career. Um, and when you're maybe putting in a little bit of extra time to learn something, when you're working hard to achieve something and so on, you should have that support. But I don't want to talk about that today because I don't want to get angry uh, phone calls from your spouses um, when I told them that you should reevaluate your relationships. Let's let's not go there, okay? Um, but the same principles do apply to your work environment. Your work environment should be supportive of what you're doing, and let's talk a little bit about that, right? And as you already know, I like using myself as an example, um, so I'm going to tell a little bit about me again. When I was at my previous um, employer, a lot of my work days felt like this. This is a Mario Kart player that has just been hit by a shell. It like stops your um, entire speed. You have to uh, catch up to the rest again. And that was what was happening um, at that company. Our goals were not aligned with each other. And the training there wasn't what it should be. And the whole day, it felt like there was friction. We were throwing shells at each other. I mean, we were all fighting and then instead of really moving forward together. And it was at this point where I was wondering, it's like, what do I really want out of my job? Because this is really not making my, me happy. And this, is, was, this was the first time that I did my direction exercise for myself. So where do I want to be in five years? Where do I think I can be in five years? And I made a plan, and it was an ambitious plan. And I took that plan to my boss at the time. And I explain to him, it's like, okay, this is where I would like to go. And I think if we um, do it with a company like this and this, we can do that together. And I can have that role inside of this company um, if all goes well. Now, that conversation didn't go as planned. Um, the result of, of that uh, conversation was that both my boss and I knew that I was going to be looking for another job really soon. So we walked away from that meeting and I ended up at another company, the company where I currently work. Um, and it changed, for me, things changed tremendously. Um, I was in a company where I could just be myself and where being myself was actually a strength in the things that I was doing. And my employer was supporting the goals, the long time, the long term direction and the short term goals that I had set for myself. And not only did the company support my goals, my goals would actually also benefit the company somehow. And this was a company where there were there also no there was no friction about um, keeping your compensation in sync with what you were actually bringing to the table. Um, it was just a yearly discussion and you would walk away and that was that was great. And I could feel I felt that I was posting these records over and over and over again. And I could set goal after goal after goal and just hit it with their support and give back to them. All of those five five year goals that I had at my previous company, I reached in less than three. And I've done that direction exercise a couple of times since then, and it has always gone like this. And that made me wonder, like, what things are important when you are choosing a company that you're working in or an environment, a work environment that you're going to be in uh, 40 hours a week? What are important things to look out for? And... There are a bunch of factors. I'm not going to list all of them, but these are probably the most important ones. 
Um, can you be yourself where you're working? Because your own well-being is more important than anything. So if you cannot be yourself at work, that is probably a red flag to start with. Um, so don't go there. Try and be, try and find an employer where you can be yourself. Who do you work with? Are there people there that um, you get along with, people that can learn from you? Um, are you supportive of each other's, uh, each other? Um, are these nice people to begin with? Um, can you achieve your own goals in this work environment that you're in? Because if you cannot achieve your own goals, yeah, then you're going to be diverting from your direction. It's going to make you unhappy. So you shouldn't be there. Do you have a long-term plan? Um, is there a long-term plan for the company and does it match with yours? Can you contribute to that plan by achieving your goals? That is a, a very, very important factor in aligning yourself with a company and, and getting the most out of it. Is the compensation fair for what you're doing? Because you don't want to be thinking about, I'm underpaid for all this hard work that I do, because then all your energy goes into that thinking instead of doing actual work. And is everything comfortable? And comfortable is a relative term, but I'm talking about are the offices comfortable? Are your second benefits in order, secondary benefits in order? Do you get a proper company car, stuff like that, all the stuff that you expect to be able to do your work properly. If you're a consultant and you have to drive around um, in a 15-year-old car that breaks down all the time, but you're expected to be at customers, that's not going to work, right? Um, but also, is it comfortable to get a hold of your managers? Um, can you easily approach them, have a talk with them, discuss some stuff that you're, you might be struggling with? Because every day you're going to have to line yourself up on that grid and, and drive the race. You better be driving the same race as everybody else around you. And this is, these are some of the main factors that I could come up with. But the main thing is if, if you find an employer where you really feel at home, it's a little bit like a relationship. It's like finding your life partner. You bring out the best in each other. Your employer should bring out the best in you, and you should bring out the best in your employer. And I know this is this is extremely cheesy, um, but it really is true. And I know it's true because I've experienced it myself, and I've seen it happen around me with a lot of other people as well. Not only at our company, also in other companies. Um, but I, I know this this... It's maybe not love, but it's it's loyalty between you and and um, you and an employer, and and you support each other in everything you do, in good days and bad. And we'll get to the bad in a minute. One of the things that I see cause friction, and that is a red flag in the IT world, um, is usually hardware. And the reason that I want to have a whole slide about hardware is that in my opinion, um, in terms of tools, being in IT is really cheap. All you need is a laptop. Maybe you need an expensive laptop, but all you need is a laptop. Go and ask a plumber how much the contents of his van are worth. Or better yet, walk into a woodworker's shop and ask him about his tools. As an amateur guitar builder uh, myself, I work with woods, and I'm standing in my wood shop at the moment. I can tell you that the tools that I need to do my hobby are a lot more expensive than the tools that I use for work. And I do not have a cheap laptop. It's just that laptops are relatively cheap when you compare them to the cost of labor and yet when you compare them to a lot of other professions. So when it comes to having a computer to do your work on, having the correct screen set up, having the right peripherals, all that sound of stuff, all that sort of stuff, if, if any of it is causing you annoyance, you should just replace it. And if you have an employer that is reluctant to do so, that's usually a big red flag because that's not the thing that you want to be skimping on. If you're paying somebody so much uh, for their time, why are you going to safe on, on even a 4,000 euro laptop that is going to last a couple of years. 
And also in Mario Kart, we recently got hardware. I don't know if you've seen these, but these are called uh, Mario Kart Home Circuit or something like this. It means that for about 120 euros, you can get a, a remote control car that has a first person view camera in it. You connect that to the Bluetooth of your Switch and you can drive a real imaginary track inside your own living room. It's pretty cool stuff. Hardware. Um, just don't make it an issue if you have to buy it for yourself, but it's not worth having frustrations over. Now, a very important factor if you've got all these other things in order is branding yourself. And because your, your employer is only going to see what you allow them to see. And if you get that trophy, you better show, show them, right? It's a very, very important to show them what you did because somebody else next to you is going to do it as well. And I know for a lot of us, this feels like bragging, um, but it's not bragging. It's just putting the work that you did in the spotlight. And even if you really, really, really hate doing this, as I did for a long time, you really have to do it. Because if all the people around you know what you're bringing to the table, it's going to be a lot easier to talk about um, your next race. It's going uh, race is going to be easier to talk about your next promotion. It's going to be a lot easier to get the lead on that new project that your company just landed. Right? You get it. Stuff will get easier because everybody knows what you're worth. And I did not do this for a long time. But what I'm doing right here at 6 a.m., and I'm questioning my life choices, but what I'm doing right here is also the result of me branding myself. Because I wanted to be a conference speaker for a few years. I only got there um, a little under two years ago. But I had that ambition for a long time, and I put in um, proposals for talks into a lot of call for papers, and it was just not happening. I had done user groups, I had done uh, guest lectures in college, internal talks inside my company, all that sort of stuff. It's not that I wasn't speaking, I just didn't make the bump to the conference level. And that's because the competition in the conference level is, is really steep. Um, a, confer a conference like NDC um, gets five to 10 times the amount of papers um, as they have slots for talks. Maybe with COVID, that number went down a little bit, but it's really bad. You're competing with a lot of other people for the same slot. So if they don't know who you are, you're, it's gonna take a while before you get a chance. So when I was at a conference as an attendee, I started branding myself. I started hanging with speakers, um, having drinks with them, and I, casually told them that what my ambitions were and that I really wanted to become a speaker myself. And I got some tips from them on how to improve the submissions to my CFPs. I also talked to the organizers briefly, not when they're really busy, um, but when you could catch somebody in the bar later in the night, talk to them, see how the conference is going for them, and then maybe ask them what they are looking for when they are grading all these papers and when they're building their agenda. And you get some really nice tips from that as well. And you make your ambitions clear to these people. And I'm not sure that that is what finally got me the chance. But the first conference that I got into was the conference where I started consciously branding myself as a aspiring speaker. And I, I landed six more in the year after that. And we're two years in and I spoke at a whole bunch of conferences since then. Unfortunately, most of them digital at the moment. But letting people know your ambitions is not showing your hand like you're playing a game of cards. No, it's just letting them know, it's like, okay, my direction is over there and um, I'm going there whether you're with me or not. But you will notice if you start doing that, that and you put yourself in the spotlight and you, you tell them what your goals are, People really aren't all assholes. Some of them will actually help you get there. So if you let people know what you want, they are going to help you with it. So at this time, you've got all of your things that you need to succeed. You know how to determine what your direction is, how to set goals for yourself. You're in an environment that you really like being in and you are branding yourself through the roof so everybody knows what you're doing. So your career is on the rails and nothing is going to stop you, right? 
Well, that's when imposter syndrome is going to hit you. Um, imposter syndrome is the built-in fear that we all have to be discovered as a fraud. It's the, the feeling that we don't really belong where we are at that moment and anybody, anybody could expose us for, us for it, right? And that's a completely normal thing to happen because when every time you make a jump in your career, um, you feel like you're promoted into a position where I don't know what I'm doing and you're figuring it out. But the people who put you in that position, they see something in you that makes them think like, okay, Hannes can handle this. Let's put him in that position and see what happens. But when we land that new position, we question ourselves. And when we get a pay raise, we question ourselves. And when we are asked for our technical expert opinion, we're going to question if we are the person who should actually be giving that opinion. It's just your mind playing tricks on you. Because the others seem to think that we are better than that we think we are. But you probably deserve every bit of credit that you're getting for the stuff that you're doing right now. And even if you know that your skills are okay, you're still gonna keep questioning yourself. I still struggle with this every time I land a new conference talk, um, especially when it's a new subject like today. You are starting to doubt the quality of your content. You're starting to doubt if people don't already know everything that you're going to tell them. You're starting to doubt if you are the expert that should be bringing this story to them. Maybe there's somebody better out there and so on and so on and so on. And this doubt, doubt process, it comes back over and over and over again. And luckily I've learned that this is a voice that I shouldn't really listen to too much, but it still happens. And it's like being Bowser in a Princess Peach uniform um, that is trying to eat me and trying to sneak up on me. What does help is that I've learned from myself that I usually don't freeze on stage. Um, so I'm not afraid of being in front of you people. I still get scared that my content isn't good enough. And it also helps that I know that if I speak about stuff that I'm passionate about and that I'm working with, that I'm going to probably be bringing you some sort of consistent story. And that there's probably some people who are not at the point in their career where they know all this stuff. So for some people, all of this will be new. And this is the key for me to dealing with this, is you, you definitely know that there's some stuff that you're gonna know more about than any other developer on your team, because that's the stuff that you've worked with, that you've um, spent a lot of time on. But the problem is that this stuff will seem obvious to you just because you spend a lot of time on it. And because it seems obvious to you, you're gonna, your mind is going to tell you, this is obvious to everybody. Everybody knows this. This is not a conference talk, but it might be new to somebody else. And I'm not gonna dive further into imposter syndrome, but now you have the essence of, of what imposter syndrome is going to do to you. There are so many, there are so many good talks out there. Uh, my good friend Heather has been speaking about it for years. And I noticed that on the agenda, Tomorrow, Melissa Houghton, who is actually in the talk today, give a little wave, Melissa. Hi. Um, is going to give a talk on how to deal with imposter syndrome tomorrow just after lunch. So if you want to get practical tips on how to beat imposter syndrome, please go and see her talk tomorrow. I'm sure it will really help you in your careers. But imposter syndrome is not the only thing that's going to hit you hard. Um, there's some other stuff that's going to get in your way. And it might be personal, it might be professional stuff, but it might happen when you least expect it. When you are focused on your goal, when you're pushing hard, when you're making steady progress, you're achieving things, it's easy to forget about all the rest. And then out of left field, you are hit really, really, really hard. And you drive off the track. And while you're floating there, falling towards your own debt, um, you wonder what happened. And this can be so many things. It can be the loss of a loved one. It can be an employer that goes bankrupt. It can be your relationship that ends. It can be depression. Um, things spiral 
out of control and you lose grip on things. And for me, it was a um, crippling burnout. In 2012, um, I had just made coach at Access. My oldest son was about a year old. He was starting to walk. And me and my partner, we were renovating our, ho our house, um, which meant that we were temporarily living, living at my in-law's place. And I woke up one day and I just couldn't bring myself to drive to work that day. And until that day, I, I am ashamed to admit, but I'm going to tell you anyway. Um, until that day, I looked at mental illness completely different than I do today. I was, I was the person who thought that if, if things get tough, you just have to pick yourself up, shift gears, and get going again. And on that day in 2012, I learned that all that those people who are in a burnout or in a depression, all that they really want is to be able to do just that. Pick yourself up and get going again. But for about three months in my life, picking myself up and going to work wasn't even an option. And in Mario Kart, if you drive off the track, you have this little guy that fishes you up and puts you back on the track. In real life, getting on track again is a lot harder, and it, uh, it really, it's really hard work. For me, it took a psychologist and anti antidepressants. Um, it took daily exercise to, to get in shape again. And it took three months of hard work just to get to the point where I could go to work again. And the reason that I'm telling you this is that this was the worst period in my life, period. I was a young dad and I didn't even have the energy to play with my own kids. And you can imagine that that was hell. And in that period, I learned so many things that made me look at life in another way um, that it's so, so worth it to, to tell you about this pain, painful period. In that period, my employer never once called me to ask when I was starting again. They called me to say, hey, Hannes, how are you doing? Is there anything that we can do to support you? And that meant the world. And I could never imagine my previous employer to ever have done that for me. But also, you're going to need the support of your love, loved ones to get through this. And you're going to maybe need the support of professionals. And there's no shame in that because... If, if you look out for your own mental, mental health, that's the best gift that you can give yourself and everybody around you. And I can tell you for sure that no job in the world is worth going through this. So if you haven't had an, a burnout, please try and avoid it at all costs. Face yourself. People who are giving it everything, they are extra vulnerable. Um, because you're so focused on what you're trying to achieve that you forget about yourself. And that is the way that people end up in burnouts. And you look at that person and like, he's so successful. Why did he get into a burnout? That's, it happens to, to, to a lot of those people. So I learned that it's important to enjoy today. And the work will still be there tomorrow. And I can't perfectly take a day off and make steady progress again tomorrow. And that's why it's important to have a direction and not a goal. In five years, I want to be there because life can mess you up for a couple of months and that's okay. It will just delay it. It will not stop your progress. But please, please, please put your own well-being before your job every day and always. If you feel like you're spending too much time, too much effort on your job, take a day off, go to the beach. You have nice beaches in Australia, I suppose. Um, so take care of yourself because that is the best advice that I can give you today. Because in those three months, I made zero progress, but that's okay. I was going strong before that and I've picked up the pace since then. It just delayed me, but I'm still coming for wherever I want to be. I've reached the end of the story that I want to tell you today. Um, I just want to quickly recap the things that I want you to remember from this talk. Okay, Success is a matter of perspective. 
it's a matter of how you look at other people and how they look at you. You have to find what your direction in your job and your life is going to be. When you're setting goals for yourself, make sure that they're smart because that those are the best kind of goals that you can reach by yourself, but that really puts you a little bit out of your comfort zone. And that's where you're also supposed to be learning just outside of your comfort zone. Find a good environment to be in. Find an, an employer that you actually enjoy working for. Um, find a family that supports you, that sort of stuff. Work on your own branding, even though, even when you don't like doing so. Um, it's very important to make sure that people know what you're capable of if you want to get ahead in your career. Battle your imposter syndrome. Go to Melissa's talk tomorrow and learn how to do that. Because it's something that all of us have, and it can really, really put a, damp uh, a, a break on how fast you are moving. And your life is more important than your job every day, every day. Remember that. My name is Hannes. I'm the head of learning and development at a company called Access in Belgium. This is my Twitter handle and my ICQ number. I'm trying to make ICQ great again, but I'm failing to do so. Um, I have about three minutes left on the clock, but there's no other talks after this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn up the volume and you can just unmute yourself if you have any questions. Right. I can see that you're all anxious to go and have some beers. That's great. I wish I was there with you to hit like the nice restaurants in Sydney. I've never been to Sydney and I hope that next year NDC Sydney will be a live event and that I will actually be selected to come there. Thank you all for being here. I hope the talk was useful to you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Um, if you have any